welcome back. Uh, I apologise for that breakdown in the broadcasting system uh, to to witnesses and also to our thousands of viewers at home. I always say thousands of viewers <laughs> at home. Um, and. I, I was in the around the world. I, I was in the middle of asking Elma a question round about um, integrated health and social care boards. You were saying uh, that uh, since their establishment, the way things that uh, have been done are, 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 have changed. And uh, my question was, why has it taken the establishment of these integrated health and social care boards to make that change, rather than uh, coming from uh, community planning partnerships since their inception? Okay. Okay, I, th I think I'd like to emphasise, first of all, that um, in some places in Scotland, um, clearly integration of health and social care had taken place prior to um, the new legislation. So some of, some of that will have been happening in parts of Scotland where they had already decided that that was right for their particular area. Um, what the new legislation has done is put um, really a legislative requirement on everyone to do that now. Um, and that is now being progressed, certainly in relation to adult services, but in a lot of areas on a voluntary basis for both adult and children's health services as well. So um, <clears throat> I, I, I guess I, I couldn't say explicitly why it hasn't happened before. I think the, for me, the, 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 the issue is that it is now starting to happen on um, a much more widespread basis across Scotland, and I think that's to be welcomed. So maybe the, the lesson for the committee when it comes to dealing with this legislation um, is that rather than hoping that certain things happen on a voluntary basis, uh, it may well be that we should put a legislative mark down um, at the very beginning. Would that be a fair I think I think statement. the point that Professor Hastings, Professor Hastings made at the very start in terms of the intent and what you would want to see as the outcome as a result of the bill, I think will be very important to make sure that that's clear. Okay, so the statement of intent is, is probably important. Uh, before the break, uh, Annette, you were wanting to, to come in. Do you still wish yeah. to do so? Um, just quickly, if that's all right. Um, I guess I just wanted to say a word in defence of um, strategic, strategic overviews in this debate. Um, I'm not suggesting that people who are advocates of community empowerment don't think that strategic action is important, but I thought it's just worth reminding um, a reminder um, because I think you know it's at the level of the individual public body or the community partnership that the the learning takes place. You know, so that it's not mental health, but it's smoke. It's not smoking. It's mental health. It's not the community centre. It's not the um, it's, it's the housing that's the issue, and that, that learning can take place at the, at the level of the institution and the same mistakes not be replicated. So there's that sort of issue about how you aggregate the learning from the different community empowerment activities that are going on and institutionalise it within public bodies. But I think there's also the issue in relation to thinking about the need for strategic coordination and action. Um, around avoiding perverse outcomes as a result of participation. Um, in my evidence, I talk about the example of street sweeping um, and how the processes of participation can lead inadvertently to um, more services being provided and better outcomes in more affluent areas. Now, it took the, the local authority that we, we did that research with then took action and said that's not what we are trying to do here. And they've, they've prioritised poor areas and a deliberate strategy. So I think it's important just to... To, 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 um, to think about you know, the sum of the parts and, the, the abil and maintaining um, capacity at the centre, dare I say it, um, to, to undo some of the wrongs that might be done. Um, Combination of legislation, cultural change and good old gumption. Um, I, I'm, and the, the recognition that sometimes um, you know, um, decisions will be made which, are, which appear to be anti-participatory. Thank you. Harry, please. No, I'll, I'll okay. leave it. David, please. Perhaps what the legislation needs to be doing is focusing more on what the outcomes should be. Uh, it's absolutely right that, that government uh, decides that, for example, we want to see a reduction uh, in the difference in life expectancy. For example, we want to see a reduction uh, in the amount of uh, children who are living in, uh, living in poverty. That is the type of thing that it is absolutely right for central government to, to be involved in. So setting the outcomes is probably a good thing for, for legislation. 
but they shouldn't necessarily get into the nitty gritty because again I get back to uh, the point I was making earlier one size does not fit all and it isn't necessarily the same same model that will apply everywhere Thank you, Ian please I, mean, I think the, the challenge for the bill presumably is how we empower communities from the top down and I think that's quite difficult uh, and I think there's agreement around the room that there's no one blueprint um, that communities are very different in nature and that this sort of activity can be quite messy. There's a real danger in trying to do it from the top down and that you crush the sort of creativity and the enterprise that's actually contributed to a lot of the community-led regeneration, which has been largely organic, happening in communities all over Scotland. Because it seems to me this bill builds on the experience that, that's happened. And it's not just middle class or rural communities. I'm also talking about working class and disadvantaged communities as well. So it seems to me the, the task in hand is how we inspire, encourage nurture and support communities um, to try and engage in this sort of process. And I think what the bill does, it offers a range of, by introducing sort of new duties and new powers, it offers a framework which makes it a bit easier for communities to engage in some of these activities and will hopefully encourage more communities to take part um, in, in this sort of process. But it's certainly something you can't impose on communities. I think the cult cultural change is crucial. And, I, and the question is, you know, I, I would hope that the bill does influence the culture, but it's, it's a sort of two-way process, I think, really. Um, and I think that cultural change needs to take place in the, the public sector because there's certainly a lot of this activity involves a degree of risk. Uh, and, and I think, that, you know, understandably, uh, public organisations can be quite risk-averse. But equally, I think there's cultural change required in the, the community sector as well. And if we're going back to disadvantaged communities, I mean, going around Scotland, what strikes me is that two of the challenges in disadvantaged communities is, one, they're very grant dependent, and, and two, they're very public se sector dependent as well. And we've got to begin to change that a bit. And, and I think there's opportunities within the bill to begin to do that, really, through um, encouraging people to take a more enterprising approach, looking at sort of ownership of assets, looking at community enterprise, etc. So I think, I suppose, what is required is, is different sorts of interventions and different approaches to support the implementation of the bill. Thank you. Um, interesting that you um, talked about the word cajole, um, which sometimes uh, can be seen as being forcing sometimes, you know. Um, Callum, I was going to come to you anyway, because obviously your organisation has been very vocal about um, forcing folk into voluntary positions. Is there a danger that if we try and force people into to participation that there will be a backlash um, it, I'm not sure about a, a, a backlash per se but it's the same principle which supports what Ian, Ian was saying was that we um, you, you, you can't yeah you can't force participation but the point is this is that the legislation could be an opportunity to create the best possible environment for participation and what what I would encourage the committee to look at is um, how you can drive into the system much more of a duty to involve that you can measure against. Uh, because I don't think that's imposing it from the top down. You're not saying exactly how that should happen, but you will then be able to test was there processes and, and means by which uh, involvement and participation was supported. But not for one second would I suggest that you would want to do anything to take away from the creativity of the grassroots activity. And in fact, what we're, what we're trying to get to is a system whereby that flourishes even more than it does now. Ian, you want to come back in? It's about cajole, but um, I certainly would, I mean, it's, it's getting that balance between how you encourage and inspire, um, but not force. So if I made that, give that impression, I could correct that. Thank you. Um, Stuart, please. <coughs> Thank you, convener. It's uh, a question for Ian, first of all. Um, a moment ago uh, in your comments, you mentioned about the cultural change and uh, the grant dependency and the public sector uh, dependency. Uh, now, I was asked a question earlier on to Mr McCulloch regarding the FSB and other business organisations assisting with, uh, with, within the communities. Um, are you aware of uh, DTAS organisations actually uh, being in contact with local FSBs uh, and, local and local other business organisations to see what actually joint operations, joint working could be done to help within communities to actually help uh, these communities help themselves? Yeah, I mean, we've got lots of examples of um, that kind of partnership taking place, really. I mean, when part of the Development Trust approach is encouraging partnerships, but redefining what we mean by partnership, 
Um, so it's you know, partners to achieve whatever aims the community is trying to achieve. And a lot of them are private sector partners, and quite often it's small and medium-sized businesses we're talking about. And sometimes they are, I mean, informal arrangements, but they can uh, sort of um, range right through to joint ventures. So I can give you lots of examples um, of, of that happening. And I think that's part of, if we're trying to encourage a more enterprising approach, then there's a good, uh, lots of lessons and experience to draw from that particular sector. Felix, can I ask Eric? Uh, obviously, in terms of big lottery funding, you have put money previously into community capacity building. What more can you do uh, to, to help communities, disadvantaged communities, participate? Well, I mean, there's various things we're involved in so many different levels. I mean, the area, as you know, that I'm interested in is community asset transfer. And, you know, it's taking, we're not, I mean, obviously this comes from a background that started in rural communities, um, but it is, it has developed over the, what, 13, 14 years we've been involved in this now that, um, as Ian was talking about, there's a lot more urban communities and deprived communities as well. It's not just the well-to-do communities are doing this sort of stuff. And we try to help them right from the very early stages all the way through. So we do provide the feasibility study money, the £10,000 that they can go and consult with you know, their communities, go and visit other projects as well. Uh, it's a two-stage process. They then come into us. If they get through stage one, we can give them more development funding to go and do all of the technical stuff they need to do. And you know, as I've spoken to the committee today about before, we have a social enterprise who is there to help them with the financial side of things. That doesn't, they'll kick in between stages one and two, but we don't just leave it there. If they get an award, that social enterprise will work them after they've got the award as well. So you know, that's just one example of how we, we deal with it in one investment area. I'm getting into jargon again, sorry. I've talked to you this morning about our place, which is a different approach. We're trying lots of different things than to try and learn lessons from these. And you know, very much taking this asset-based approach and fitting it to a community of learning. We had the first meeting of that uh, about three weeks ago. We were bringing people together to, to learn from each other's experience and pass on the lessons and just see where a wider community goes, not just big lottery fund, but where a wider community can go with this. Thank you. Felix, please. Yeah, just to uh, answer Stuart's question about the kind of grant dependencies worth highlighting a report from Community Land Scotland recently, which looked at the community land trusts and uh, the, the role they have with uh, their grant funding compared to their um, business income. What it showed is a lot of economic development through uh, community energy and situations like that, and kind of punctures that myth a bit about uh, community land trust, development trust, etc., being grant dependent. So it's, it's well worth uh, looking at that piece of research. And Barry, please. Just to come back to, to the point about joint working between business organisations and the community sector, the business improvement district model is a good example of this. Um, in Curlook, which has just been recently passed, it is development trust led, but with the involvement of small business owners. And within the bill and, and any associated documents, are, there was a slight omission in that the bid model does bring people together in a specific locality to deliver additional services for the business community, which also benefits the wider community. I'll just make one point. I mean, obviously, we're a grant giver, but we're not in the business of trying to create grant dependency. But quite often, it's our grants that kick things off and get things started. And we're also looking a lot more now at social investment. And we are asking projects to take a much more enterprising approach. But quite often, these things won't get off the ground unless they've got some grants. So it's not grant dependency we're talking about here. It's injecting grant into let them get started and then making them enterprising. Stuart, you want to come back briefly? Very briefly, thank you. Just to Mr McCulloch. I mean, I gave the example of Carluc, but I mean, does he have any examples of, uh, of that type of activity in places like uh, maybe Easter House or Craig Miller or, or elsewhere in, in the schemes uh, across the country? Miller, um, but and to be completely honest, that in many areas where um, there is deprivation, as local authority led in many cases, um, because the capacity is is not been there in the past. Um, but um, I think as the bill represents and shows um, community empowerment involvement, you know it requires a step change. And from our perspective, it's how small businesses play a part in that and contribute to that process where they can. Thank you, uh, Mark. Please. I think it's just thinking about the the outcomes that we were speaking about and how the 
the success or otherwise of the legislation would be measured because obviously um, empowering communities is one thing but those communities then using that empowerment and how they how they use that empowerment is something very different and different communities will have different ideas about what they want to do sometimes ambition and uh, what can be achieved will not tally and that's going to be the case whatever uh, legislation is put in place so I guess it's about how do we ensure that when we're looking at how the legislation is operating in practice once it has been passed how do we ensure that we are measuring correctly what's happening so that we don't say either it's been a runaway success and that doesn't match what communities are saying but also we don't say that because some communities have not been able to realize the ambitions that they would have had for perfectly valid reasons we don't fall into the trap of suggesting that the legislation is therefore uh, either failing or ha has not met what it was supposed to be doing. Okay, any comments on that? I'll, Callum, please. I'll, I'll make one uh, specific suggestion. Is that I, in my last comment, I talked about a duty to involve. Well, in guidance, then, you could suggest something for uh, something that we just talked about in the, the Commission on Local Democracy is um, more citizens' juries approaches. Why not drive into the community planning system an annual citizens' jury process um, or in terms of setting the agenda for community planning but also testing against what's been delivered? I think that what you can do is just set the enabler in the legislation but then in the guidance look at the kind of specific suggestions about how you would test that in an ongoing fashion. very much. Anyone else? No. In which case, can I thank you very much for your evidence this morning? Uh, I think that has been extremely useful. Um, I apologise for the breakdown in the broadcast system. Um, what I would be interested uh, in hearing from you, and if you could feed it into the clerks, um, is whether or not you think that this round table uh, way of taking evidence uh, it, it suits you. Um, I know that many of you have given formal evidence before and uh, in different ways. As a committee, a number of members like these roundtable sessions, but I'm keen to get your feedback uh, and empower you uh, in that regard. Thank you very much, and I suspend uh, until 25 past for uh, a, a change in witnesses. Thank you.
you. Um, I now welcome our second panel. Can I welcome Alistair McKinley, Head of Community Planning and uh, Community Empowerment Unit. Alistair, I understand that you're going to introduce your colleagues and uh, tell us what their remit is when it comes to the bill. That, thank you, convener. In fact, I'll ask them to introduce themselves, uh, if that's okay. I know there's quite a few of us and we each have different responsibilities. So maybe if we can start with Norman. I'm Norman McLeod. I'm from the Scottish Government Legal Directorate. I'm Ian Turner. I'm the building leader. Amanda Fox, food and drink team, and I have a responsibility for the allotment section of the bill. Uh, Dave Thompson, Land Reform and Tenancy Unit, um, responsible for the Part 4 elements right to buy. I'm Rachel Rayner from the Scottish Government Legal Directorate. I'm dealing with the allotments and the right to buy provisions. Alistair, to make any opening statement, first of all? Uh, no thanks, convener. Uh, in which case, uh, obviously, you heard the evidence from our previous panel. Um, one of the things which was raised by um, uh, Annette uh, was a uh, roundabout statement of intent uh, when it came to dealing with empowering disadvantaged communities. Uh, has there been any thought to that? Certainly, it's something we've been very conscious of in the, in the wide ranging engagement that we've, we've done on, on the bill. And I think the first thing to say is that the bill just now um, provides opportunities for all communities in Scotland um, around asset transfer, around participation requests. But we certainly recognise that capacity to um, benefit from these opportunities will not be evenly spread uh, across the country. Though I was particularly heartened in the earlier discussion, the recognition that just because people are in disadvantaged communities, it doesn't mean they're not able to do a lot of things for themselves. But at the minute, um, uh, the Scottish Government already invests in a range of things, um, that some of which were mentioned earlier. So um, the Community Ownership Support Service, which provides some of that technical expertise that was, that was mentioned as important, um, is focused on disadvantaged areas around asset ownership. Um, the Strengthening Communities Programme would be another one to highlight, which again was mentioned, which is doing that direct investment in the community anchor organisations, to use the, the shorthand jargon um, briefly, in those uh, uh, disadvantaged areas too. So it's something we're conscious of. Um, and I think, as you said at the outset, convener, um, the bill won't do everything. And those are policy responses, I suppose, to try and uh, address that issue. And the final thing is that we've been conscious, and it's in the legislation, um, that the public authorities, the duties that they have, have in this new legislation, um, they also have to fulfil their equalities uh, uh, duties set out in other legislation. Thank you. Uh, we heard a lot about culture change and common sense, and while it's possible sometimes to legislate for culture change, it's uh, not so easy to legislate for gumption. How do we ensure um, that as we go through this process um, that we uh, get the maximum amount of gumption uh, out there? Um, what, what beyond the bill uh, do we need to do to ensure that logicality comes into play? Well, I think the first thing to reflect, and I think, again, it came up in the discussions which was helpful is that the bill tries in the way any legislation can to found itself on some gumption uh, i mean it does try to reflect some of the things that we know were already happening um, beyond that i think we will have a very important job to do um, again trying to adopt the approach we've taken to be inclusive in developing the legislation on promoting the bill and re recognizing that it is a piece of legislation some people will struggle with some of the language and concepts so um, in the clearest possible language we can in the way that we did with the, the the easy read version of our policy memorandum and we've got a big job to go out and promote what the bill's actually about and what opportunity it, it provides and perhaps um, uh, 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 <coughs> explain to people the committee's interest in the fact that a lot of this is common sense in terms of framing the the draft bill uh, how much attention has been paid to, to stakeholders. Let's uh, look at the allotments scenario, Ms Fox, uh, where obviously we have had uh, a number of responses back from uh, folks who are involved in allotments and the various societies. Um, can I ask how much attention has been paid uh, to what stakeholders have said uh, in terms of, draft, uh, of coming up with the draft bill? Absolutely. Um, 
We've actually had quite a substantial amount of consultation specifically on the allotments area. The first was through the consultation on the Community Empowerment and Renewal Bill back in June 2012. Um, subsequent to that, we actually had uh, a, a, a consultation which solely looked at potential duties and powers relating to allotments. That was in April 2013. And then the individual provisions in different areas were then again consulted on in November 2013 through the Community Empowerment Bill consultation. In addition to these written exercises, we've actually also gone out to stakeholders and had quite an, a lot of um, meetings with both the growing community and also uh, our colleagues in local authorities and COSLA. Um, and one of the more complicated aspects of the bill deals with common good. Um, can I ask, obviously there are some very uh, forthright opinions out there about common good funds and what should and shouldn't be done. Um, again, can I ask what um, stakeholder consultation there has been uh, in, in terms of that part of the bill? That wasn't addressed separately. It was part of the, the, the two consultations, the exploratory consultations and, and, and the, the secondary consultation. I think it's important to say at this stage that because the nature of the bills around community empowerment, our focus there has been on um, participation and transparency in common good, uh, uh, what, what it is, helping to establish what it is in, in local authority areas and how it's, how it's used. Um, so it, was, it, it wasn't done separately from the, from the broader consultation. Thank you. And please... Really just can, I, can I stay on the topic of allotments just now? Um, we had received evidence from the Scottish Allotments and Gardens Society and really what, I'll just kind of summarise some of what they're saying is the bill repeals the existing legislation and in doing so some of the protection for plot holder and allotment sites contained in the provisions of the old legislation appear to have been lost. Ms. Fox. Um, the, the bill actually updates quite a lot of provisions. There are a number of powers and duties which have been removed from the bill, and I can, I can just go over those briefly if that would be helpful. Yeah. Um, so the duties and powers that have been omitted, so the duties, if there's been a duty to provide access to allotments has been removed. This duty was not restated in the bill since it is already provided under the general law of landlord and tenant. Um, in terms of powers that have been omitted from the current draft of the bill, the use of local authority rooms for discussions on allotment related business has been removed and this was as a result of consultation with local authorities who indicated that buildings for this purpose could be made available but there should be a requirement to pay as, with, as is the case with other community groups. Also, the powers of entry on unoccupied land for the purpose of providing allotments, the powers for compulsory purchase of land, um, the power to enter unoccupied land for the purpose of providing allotments reflects the post-war area in which it was written, um, and it came into force really to drive an increase in food production, and it was viewed that this was unnecessary at the present time. Local authorities have also indicated that they're unaware of any situation where these powers have actually been used for the provision of allotments and they considered them if they were to use them that they would actually be a last resort um, and that was mainly due to the financial costs involved with such action. Um, the Scottish Government views these as being draconian and rather difficult to justify due to the costs and additionally such action would deprive a person from their right to the actual peaceful enjoyment of their property and could not be justified in the wider public interest on the basis of the provision of allotments. Moving on to the next power that's been removed, the power of a local authority to charge a fair rent. The government believes that land values and the costs associated with managing allotment sites are very likely to vary between different sites, depending on where you are within Scotland. Consequently, decisions made about the level of rents would be best made at a local level. And as such, um, the bill actually requires local authorities to make regulations that relate to rent specifically. Uh, the power to, for a local authority to purchase plants, seeds and fertilisers to sell to tenants has also been removed. 
And this is, this is a rather outdated duty and reflects the post-war era again in which it was drafted. And it came into force at a time when there weren't actually very many garden centres or agricultural suppliers around at the time. So this has been excluded from the bill, but it doesn't actually prevent local authorities continuing, continuing this practice should they so wish and should there so be a need. Um, the next power that's been removed is the improvement and adaptation of land for, for allotments. This was uh, considered unnecessary to restate as it's actually part of a local authority's general powers and under subsequent le legislation. The rating of allotments, um, the power allows a local authority to deem itself the occupier of a land despite it being let for allotments and it was considered unnecessary again to restate the provision as subsequent legislation has excluded allotments from the ratings regime. Um, and the provisions relating to a land leased for allotments, these provisions have been updated and are actually reflected in the bill. Just to make the committee aware, um, the provisions in the bill that relate specifically to private landowners, which ultimately deal with the termination of leases and also in relation to compensation, have also been removed from the bill. And the rationale behind that was, if you bear with me whilst I refer to my notes, um, the government believes that these arrangements are actually better suited to be dealt with under individual lease arrangements and it was difficult to see what justification there was for interfering with such private arrangements. In addition, general law on landlord and tenants would apply to these arrangements and to support private landowners with lease negotiations, in 2013 the government actually supported the production of a guide for landowners which was developed um, in liaison with the Community Land Advisory Service. And this encourages landowners, and I should say it applies to both private and public landowners, to make sites available for growing food. And it gives it comprehensive information and suggestions about background details in relation to, to try and equip landowners to play their part in making more land available to local communities in Scotland for growing food. I'm happy to provide that detail to the committee if they would find that. That Just another small point, um, well, a huge point actually, the financial memorandum attached to the bill, um, some of our um, sector bodies have highlighted um, a difference of opinion, shall we say? It's, um, it's very difficult because of the different ways that allotments are managed across Scotland. It's very difficult, it was very difficult to actually get definite costs for the individual the, dif the individual duties and powers that were required in the bill and what those implications were on local authorities. Um, we've made estimates of them, but obviously they are only estimates. And it was very, very difficult to get tangible information relating to the different impacts. But we've, ident we've tried to identify the areas which may incur costs. Thank you. John Wilson, supplementary. Just a supplementary, Dr Fox, and I'm glad you're going to provide us with the, the briefing that I've just read from. The, you will be aware there was a major campaign in Glasgow, particularly around the tenemental properties, the, where the residents tried to take over vacant and derelict land to create small areas where residents could grow their own food. How would the changes that you've outlined in terms of legislation post-war and, and what is proposed before us today change the, the actions of the individuals or groups that want to take over vacant land to put it back into productive use for food in those areas? Um, what I will say, under the wider provisions of a bill, so under the asset transfer and the community right to buy, there are there is scope for communities such as the ones in Glasgow to approach the uh, relevant authority to take over that land. I'll defer to my colleagues in relation if they want to add to that, but there are scopes in the wider power, so the allotment section won't necessarily help them per se, but the wider provisions of the bill will. Yeah, yeah, yes, indeed. Um, I think that's one of the, the, the examples, uh, Mr Wilson, that we heard a lot and strongly influenced part five on asset transfer. And in terms, linking back to the question about engaging with stakeholders, it was actually the community growing, some community growing colleagues, who took us from a place where we were focusing very much on community bodies owning assets to the broader um, uh, provisions in the bill around lease 
management and indeed use, because some people said, well, we won't necessarily want to own a piece of land in, 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 in the um, in public sector, but we would love to be able to grow on it. Uh, and, and part five provides a process where that case can be made, the benefits of community growing be made, and uh, then the, 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 the duty on the authority to respond to that. That's also public sector owned land, if that was the vacant derelict land. Uh, uh, and as uh, Amanda says, the extension of the community right to buy. Um, uh, uh, now across the country would be another tool for communities to use in that circumstance. Thank you. Stuart McMillan, please. Uh, just as, uh, regarding the, the consultation, uh, once again, um, what type of activity took place to try to uh, have as many uh, consultees and responses uh, from, the, from schemes uh, across Scotland? Um, because, I mean, as we heard in the previous session, uh, it's, uh, th there are challenges in really trying to, uh, to, to, to get information and get feedback uh, from various parts of the country. And also, I mean, this whole bill is about community empowerment. So how did you, what activity, activity did you do and undertake to really try to get information from the people in the, in the schemes of Scotland? I mean, the first thing is that we relied a lot on some of the people that you heard from this morning. So working through uh, intermediaries like Development Trust Association Scotland, Scottish Community Alliance, the Scottish Community Development Centre. Um, an organisation called Community Development Alliance Scotland ran uh, a conference inviting along a, a number of community activists. Um, obviously, there's always more you would like to do. Um, we, we, we didn't, for example, go out and, and, and visit specifically about the bill, a range of our most disadvantaged communities. Um, that is partly resourced because we were a small team. Um, but I certainly feel that we tried extremely hard to ensure that we had a wide range of, of, of voices heard. Um, uh, ministers and, and officials had 40 meetings um, uh, during the second stage, and we obviously did have the first stage of consultation where, again, um, this wasn't a case where we wrote out our ideas, sent them out, put them on the website and waited for people to re reply. We were very proactive and tried to get out and, uh, and, and speak to people face to face. Did you, uh, I would assume that, uh, that you spoke to the, the various uh, community councils um, across, across Scotland as well. Community councillors were involved in a number of the, of, of, of the sessions that we were involved with. Um, and uh, uh, it might be better, actually, if we provide you with a fuller report on the consultation. Would that be helpful, rather than we try and remember which sure. of the 40 yes, it would we did? Be, thank you. I think that would be extremely useful. Um, uh, and what would be useful as well, I think we've heard from community councils in terms of some of the other work that we've been doing on the lead-up to this, uh, who feel that uh, some local authorities um, are not adhering uh, to the, the legislation and guidance as stands. And it would be interesting, I think, for us to, to get an idea of what kind of feedback that uh, you guys uh, had in your consultation. Absolutely. And, and also, sorry, can you, I can also, because it did come up in the earlier conversation, we did a survey um, uh, uh, of local authorities about community councils, so we've got details of how many had contested elections, how many are actually active, and if you like, we can make sure that you have that. Um, information as well. Extremely useful indeed. If that could be provided, we'd yeah. be very grateful. Uh, Mr. McDonald. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner. I, I, I guess we, you know, we were discussing earlier on around um, how how success, if you like, of the legislation could be measured and what would be the the outcomes that would be sought. But obviously, sitting alongside that is the issue of expectation management as well, and during your discussions and, and uh, soundings with communities, do you get the feeling that there is an understanding that, that, that this bill, while it will, I think it will have a, a significant impact in terms of communities and empowerment of communities, um, that there, there has to be a degree of expectation management from, from communities and from legislators as well around what, what can be achieved and how that will, how that will look? Yes, I think so. But my experience working with communities for a number of years now in policy is that it doesn't take too long for communities to understand precisely those issues around expectation. Um, uh, in my experience, community activists are some of the most reasonable and sensible people you can speak to, as long as um, the conversation happens in a respectful, open and, and, and trusting way. And certainly through all our consultation, we've been working very hard to explain to people that the bill is only one element 
uh, as the convener said, the minister makes the point repeatedly of how we might go about empowering communities. Culture, resources are the, the ones that Mr Mackay brings up all the time. So um, it is important we do that, um, whilst not seeking to underplay, I think, the, the, the part that the bill can play in empowering communities and culture change and so on. Um, and I expect that will be a fairly straightforward thing to do, as I say. Yeah, because I mean, the, the, the follow on from that and uh, the reason why I raised that is obviously there was the discussion as well around community capacity and how community capacity uh, is developed. I mean, I made the point that, you know, there are there is a, ve a feeling out there that community capacity is required in, in some of our most deprived areas. I actually think these are some of the areas where you see the the, the most activism within communities. It's just a question of the support that these community organisations are, are, are given and have available to them. Um, now, obviously, you can't legislate for everything, but there will be a role for legislative guidance uh, in terms of setting parameters and expectations for public bodies as to how they uh, work with community organisations who want to, to take forward some of the elements of community empowerment. Uh, do, you, do you envisage guidance that will basically spell out to, for example, local authorities what is expected of them if a community, uh, for example, a deprived community where there is not ready access to some of the, the expertise that might be required to enable the drafting of a business case or the uh, handling of a transfer of an asset, uh, if that is not within that community, that there would be an expectation on public bodies to provide that support and that would be spelled out fairly clearly in the guidance that follows the legislation. Yeah, I think the first thing to say is that all the guidance, and it's an important principle, we will develop in very close partnership with the kinds of people that you, you listened to this morning, colleagues in COSLA, colleagues in the community sector, because we want that guidance to reflect the best possible practice that, that, that we can. Um, we're already in quite a, a positive position with things like um, the, the statutory instrument that now exists on community learning and development, which places um, uh, obligations on local authorities to assess capacity in communities and to do things uh, about that. Um, there are also other things that I'm sure we could discuss with people around how we ensure, to take a specific example, around the participation requests, which I think is one of the very new and has been warmly welcomed aspects of the bill because it puts the communities on the front foot raising the issues that are on their agenda. In guidance there, we could talk about the, the, the quality of engagement and, and the requirement to use existing tools that, that promote quality engagement, for example. Um, so yes, I think the guidance is another opportunity to, to really lift people's game in, in, in terms of participation and empowerment. Thanks. Okay, Anne, please. Yeah, just um, on that lifting people's game, have we looked at or have you consulted with um, a lot of the groups, I know with, certainly within my area, um, community groups meet around the medium of sport. Have you looked, have you spoken to, to the people in sport? Again, I think I, would, I think I would need to refer to the detail of the kinds of people who came to the events that, 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 that we ran. I mean, certainly I have come across people like Beath Community Development Trust who've got a very close interest in sport. Um, uh, but, yeah, I would have to look at the detail of who we've spoken to about that. But we certainly recognise that, you know, an interest in sport is a, a very positive thing in terms of empowerment often. And for the reasons that, I mean, it does involve um, huge parts in our community and obviously for, for very good reasons, you know, I think that that should be a viable partner within it. If, if we could get that information, it would be useful. It may well be that the committee will write to you and ask for for other pieces of information after this, but I, I think that helps us in terms of, of where we're going to. Um, HIV Scotland and Inclusion Scotland highlighted possible unintended, unintended negative impacts uh, on those that are currently marginalised from engagement. Um, Inclusion Scotland stated that communities should not be defined by a narrow definition based on location and residence. Disabled people are often excluded from traditional communities or have specific needs and interests that are best addressed by their own community. How do we ensure that communities of interest are best served by this bill and what does the bill do uh, to ensure that, uh, that they are included? 
Well, interestingly, Kavina, you read your question about, about consultation. We've got half a dozen little examples of things that we think we changed um, quite significantly after uh, we heard from the consultation, and one of them was around uh, improving the definition of community body uh, in, in the, the, the elements around participation to do two things. One was people felt that the draft bill, we defined community body in different ways and it was getting confusing, so we've simplified that um, uh, to have the same definition in different parts of the bill. Um, and the second thing was it is now drafted in such a way that you could be a community of interest. Again, interestingly, the discussion about top-down and bottom-up and the challenges of empowering from above, which in a sense some aspects of legislation will always be, but the definition of community body uh, leaves the community to define itself. So a community body has to be certain things, but how you define yourself as a community is left to that community. Thank you. Is there any more questions from the committee? No, in which, oh, John? We'll make good use of the time while they're here. Uh, so, sorry about this. It's the, one of the issues that is pertinent to the bill is the community asset transfer debate. Uh, and communities are being, in some areas, actively encouraged to take on community buildings, particularly sports facilities. Uh, and we had a discussion, part of a discussion earlier, about the long-term financial viability of those assets. Uh, has there, what thought has been given to ensure that where communities do take on those assets, uh, that they, they do get the financial support? Because when you get a community asset, and, or any organisation, I'm not just talking about communities, it sometimes takes several years for them to build up uh, a sustainable, financially sustainable asset. So what support do you see being given to communities where they do take on sports facilities particularly uh, in the longer term? Because one of the suggestions that was made by one of the local authorities was that you know, we can give the community the asset, the community can go and get the grants to do the asset up, but if they're not viable after two or three years, the asset transfers back to the local authority at the value they, they've transferred it at despite the fact there may be a couple of million pounds worth of uh, improvements carried out in that asset. So how do we ensure the communities do uh, are allowed the time and the opportunity to develop the economic case and viability uh, to sustain that asset? Mr McKinley. I think if I may, Mr Wilson, I'll make, make a broader point first, which is that, um, and, and I'm sure Ian Cook would support me on this, that we've got to be very careful uh, and there was some anxiety when we were developing the bill around this, that somehow this legislation signals that we want all communities to take on assets. For some communities, that just will not be the right way to develop their communities. We have heard and can fully understand that what might look like an asset on the face of it can be a liability. So actually, and we try and build this into the process of the bill, it's all about a business case. It's all about ensuring from the outset, before you transfer an asset, that you've asked those questions about sustainability and viability and that it's a really clear um, view that people are being taken. In terms of existing report, Eric Samuel, uh, support, sorry, Eric Samuel mentioned the Growing Community Assets uh, Fund. Um, there is the Scottish uh, Land Fund in, in, in rural communities. Um, uh, in terms of revenue funding, which is often the case raised with us, that that's the issue going forward. Well, I think Ian Cook raised an interesting point about community organisations being enterprising. I think that's a fundamental part of this of this um, uh, 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 of this approach going forward. Um, and there will be other ranges of funding, like the Climate Challenge Fund, which I know is very popular amongst many communities that that um, uh, uh, you know people might be able to access. But that business of actually looking at the hard sums is, is a critical part of this. Okay. But can we, just to follow up on that, Eric Samuels gave an example of where they had extended the funding from two to three years for some organisations. Some community organisations, and I have to declare a particular uh, vested interest in this uh, because I'm actively involved in the community, my own local community, but we're going to take on a community asset and part of the long-term planning of that community asset and the financial viability is tied into major housing developments proposed for the area. The difficulty is, is if those major housing developments don't take place within the time scale the community asset is developed, then the financial viability plans could fall apart 
for the sake of, say, three or five years before those uh, housing developments finally come to fruition. So how do we ensure, or is there any fallback position that we can actually uh, envisage that allows those communities to be able to say, look, our financial viability strategy was all predicated on certain things happening at cer certain times due to other circumstances. Those haven't happened. Could we get an extension to the funding process to allow us to continue to operate until everything is in place to make it a long term? Because we're not talking about sustainability in five years. We're talking about sustainability over 25, 30, 50 years for some of these assets. So it's about trying to look at that because the other issue is Big Lottery have indicated they will only give funding if these premises are seen to be vi viable long term. So how do we ensure that we support communities where they do take on those assets, that they can be safeguarded, that because other factors didn't come into play, they, they can <coughs> turn to help, for help from someone to ensure that they get, actually get fruition and they put their in, on track with the investment strategy and the sustainability strategy they're, they're hoping for. You can't legislate for changing factors, but Mr McKinley, if you could attempt that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, that's incredibly helpful, actually, because it's a reminder of just how complex this is sometimes and that each case is different. Um, uh, and a point at which to welcome the, the, the committee's ongoing involvement and interest in this bill. It's been incredibly helpful to us that you've been unearthing a whole range of examples like that through your regeneration um, inquiry and so on. We have to continue to listen to that, and whether it's a, a legislative issue or whether it's a policy issue, we have to make sure that... For example, the community ownership support service that can at least help with learning and advice on these issues is picking up on them. I'm sure Ian Cook, uh, where the, the course is, is, is located, will do. Um, but it is one of these things that we'll just have to keep listening and ensuring that, because fundamentally, it's not about owning the asset simply for its own sake, though that can have huge benefits, we know, in terms of sense of ownership and, and, and uh, uh, positive view for the future. It's about achieving outcomes, and if the outcomes are going to be so fantastic um, uh, for, for communities in Scotland, then we must essentially have that culture that looks to overcome these barriers in order to achieve the, the, the outcomes that, that people want. And Cameron Buchanan, please. Thank you. I was just going to ask about the common good land, alienable and inalienable land. Can that be used for allotments if it's purchased? Is that, a, is that possible? It seems to be needing clarification on what is common good land, and it seems to, be, to, to most of us very unclear what can be used, what it can be used for. I, I'm, a, I'm afraid we'll have to get you back because there are six of us, and the, 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 the common good policy specialist is not one of us. Right. Um, so, uh, so we'll have to get back to you on that specific point. But just to reiterate again, I think um, uh, that the, uh, the bill really only deals with local people's involvement, including community councils, I should say, because I know some community councillors felt that community councils are absent from the, from the legislation. They're specifically mentioned around uh, common good, and they're also a specific, specifically mentioned body in the participation requests, so a recognition of, of, of their role, the important role many community councils play. But on the specific point, we'll have to get back to you. Finally, um, a lot of the submissions that have come from uh, local authorities and community planning bodies have been very positive, um, which we often find. How do we ensure that local authorities, um, community planning partnerships, uh, don't end up taking a, a narrow interpretation of the bill? The parts that I mentioned uh, earlier in terms of asset transfer and participation requests, I think shift the landscape significantly because it is about a duty for them to respond to rights community organisations have. If we take participation requests, which I think in my own view has been the, the bit that people haven't quite seen the potential of yet, it means that a group of community bodies in one of our more disadvantaged areas, working with young people who've got really good ideas to how to make the lives of those young people better, they don't now sit and wait until they're consulted by children's services. They put together their case and the authority has to respond. So I think that in itself, and I've heard speaking to local government colleagues during the consultation, um, that they feel this will make them up their game. 
they can see it coming, they can see that communities are going to approach them, so they're thinking they have to get their, um, their, their own processes in order. And I think also, looking at the detail, once we get into the detail of the community planning um, uh, uh, provisions, community bodies there are now a more significant player. They are people who participate in community planning, not just people who are consulted on a plan. Um, so again, I think that's something, and also I should say, um, community planning partners now are, are required to properly resource community bodies, um, uh, and forgive me the lawyer, it doesn't say properly, obviously, in, in the legislation, but, but the fact that there's a recognition in the law now that um, there should be a, an obligation to resource the involvement of community bodies is, an, is another significant change. Uh, Dr. Fib, that wasn't the final question. Um, Part three, uh, on participation requests, um, the meaning of a community controlled body. Uh, it says in this part, a community controlled body means a body, whether corporate or unincorporated, having a written constitution. Why does the body need to have a written constitution in order to participate? Ian, would you be better placed, do you think, to deal with the detail of that? It, it, in part, it comes out from the consultation itself, where people did have a view about what community involves, what community means, and that you do need some sort of structure when people are going into a legislative process, actually what it will be. So the written constitution is, we believe, because it's not a huge amount that is required under the written constitution, it's the minimum that's required in order to be involved in the process. And it's the same here as it is for asset transfer requests as well. Very interesting to, to see the responses to the consultation uh, in that regard. Yeah. Thank you very much. Can I thank you very much for your evidence today. Um, I now suspend the meeting and we move into private session. Thank you.